Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to discuss three ways that economists think and talk about gross domestic product. So we think and talk about GDP in terms of total output, uh, but also as total expenditure and also as total income. So in this video I'm going to discuss why these three ways of talking and thinking about GDP are equally valid, equally legitimate. Now this is actually the second video in a series of videos that I'm doing on GDP. The first video was all about defining GDP and the next video will be on measuring uh, GDP. This is all about the equivalence of output, income and expenditure. Now textbooks will often motivate the equivalence of, of these three things using what we call a circular flow diagram and I'm just going to follow their lead on that. These diagrams can be a bit abstract, but uh, one of the things that they illustrate is how money flows between sectors in a very simplified economy. Now in the diagram, you can see that the flows of money in terms of total expenditure, total output and total incomes, they're all equal to one another. Uh, the argument is that our real life economies behave in a similar way, they're just more complicated. So the model is analogous to our, our economies that we study. So let's just say that we have a really simple economy with only two sectors. So we only have households and firms. The households supply the inputs to production to our firms. So labor, land, entrepreneurship, etc. So there's a flow of resources from the households to the firms. As compensation for these inputs, the firm will pay back households. So there will be a money flow back in exchange for the inputs from the firms to the households. This flow will be composed of wages, rents and profits. Uh, that is the household sees this as income. Now the firm uses the inputs that are supplied by the households in order to produce goods and services that the households will buy from the firms. So there is a flow of resources of goods and services going back to the households from the firms. And there will be a corresponding flow of expenditure of monies to the firms from the households in exchange for those goods and services. From the perspective of the households, this money flow is expenditure, but we can also see that it's revenue for the firm. Uh, it represents the value of the goods and services that are being, are being produced by the firm. So we have a circular system here. The inside arrows measure the flow of resources we have from the household to the firm in terms of inputs, and then back again to the household in terms of outputs. Corresponding to these flows of resources are flows of money. So the black outer ring and the purple notation represent the flow of money through our little economy. And the idea is that uh, the flow just keeps on going and going in a loop. So the firm uses their revenue they get from the households to pay for the inputs to production. So the money goes back to the households via income and then the household spends that income on the goods and services. Uh, so the cycle starts again and it just goes round and round. The flows of our money here are equal, corresponding to the value of the flow of resources back and forward between the two sectors. Now, this is a highly simple model. We're assuming that there's no government here. We, we assume no exports or imports, so there's no international trade. I haven't included a financial sector. We uh, assume that the household spends all of their income, so there's no savings, uh, there's no lending. So this is a very simple economy and a, quite an unrealistic scenario. But you can see that the flow of money is here in terms of expenditure, income, and the value of our output are all equal to one another. That's what sustains this circular loop, this interrelationship between the parts of our model. And the idea behind the circular flow model is that even if we made a more complicated model that was more realistic, so even if we added different sectors, so maybe a government, a financial sector, are we allowed for trade? Once we trace the flows of expenditures, the flows of incomes, and the value of the total output, uh, they will still be equal to one another. This equality is like somehow a fundamental part of how the economy is working. And this is just the general conceptual point of the circular flow model that points to the equality of output expenditure and income. For every dollar of output produced, this is associated with $1 of income for the providers of the inputs. Equally, we can think about that in terms of an equivalent expenditure associated with purchasing that output. Now, granted, there will be some differences between what here is a very stylized model and the real world. You might have an underground economy. People might physically lose money. People might hide money under their mattress. But apart from such cases, we do conceptually in economics take expenditure, production and in income to be equivalent kind of in theory. 
Now, if we wanted to find GDP in our very simple circular economy here, we could do it three ways. We could find the value of the output, but we could equivalently just add up total incomes or again, equivalently look at total expenditure. We would get the same amount of the GDP regardless, the same outcome. And that's exactly what we do in practice with our real economies. There are three ways that we measure GDP in practice. We either find the value of total output. This corresponds to what we call the value added approach. We also have the income approach, which adds up all the incomes in the economy and the expenditure approach, which adds up all the expenditure in the, in the economy. Now, you probably do have some residual worries about the applicability of this circular flow model to the real world. But I will say a lot of worries that you have, you know, are possibly and hopefully cleared up when we go through the details of these different ways of measuring GDP. So, for instance, in the expenditure approach, we're essentially claiming that for every dollar of output produced, this corresponds to one dollar of expenditure. But then you might say, well, what happens if the firm doesn't sell the good or service that they produce during the time period that we're looking at, right? So the firm produces, but there's no sale to a consumer. Actually, once you look into the expenditure method, there's a whole story about what's called inventory. Uh, and if the firm's making something that's not sold in the time period that we're concerned with, you know, the time period of the GDP that we're concerned with, uh, that good or service goes into what we call inventory and we treat it as if the firm buys it from themselves. So there is an expenditure associated with the production when the good sits in the inventory. It's just that the firm, in terms of our accounts, uh, are buying it from themselves when it sits in inventory. So we preserve the equality here between production and expenditure, but we need to go into the details of the expenditure method of measuring GDP in order to see how that equality is preserved. So in the next video in the series, I'm going to go through in more detail the three ways of measuring GDP. So the value added approach, the income approach and the expenditure um, approaches. But that's it for this video. I do hope that it helped. Thank you so much for watching um, and have a great day.